All right, so number three, hold downs. And this is the last thing for your shear wall design. So again, coming back to it, let's draw our crude shear wall, 20 feet long. We have our third mode of failure, right? You have our first one, which was shear failure through the sheathing itself. And then you have your second mode of failure, which was sliding of the entire structure off of the foundation. So we, we adequately sized anchor bolts. And then you have your third mode of failure, which is overturning of your whole structure off of the foundation. So that third one is the overturning. And that we counteract by installing what are called hold downs at the ends of our shear walls. So we would what we would do is we'd install a hold down here and a hold down here. And again, going back, I don't want to get too far into it, but if you did have an opening here, you might be considering and saying, well, I actually want to look at this as maybe two separate shear walls. And again, you can call it, you can design as a what's called a perforated shear wall, which you'd have to look into the special provisions for seismic, for the design of seismic and wind, um, the end, that other NDS catalog for lateral um, design. Uh, or you could say, well, I'm going to do two smaller shear walls, you know, one and two, and that means I would do a hold down, four hold downs, you know, have it look something like that. But for us today, we're not going to get so crazy. Why are we getting so crazy? And we are just going to do one shear wall, hold down at both ends of the shear wall, and there's no penetrations through the shear wall. Hold downs, you need to make sure that they have ad adequate capacity in tension because what's happening is you have overturning forces from your lateral effects, E horizontal, and you have some overturning moment, which then is resolved through the full length of your shear wall, which is a compression at one end and then a tension force at the other end. And that's where your hold downs hang onto that building, make sure it doesn't flip over. So that is, that's the mechanics of how hold downs were invented and why we have them and why they're in the locations that they are. So how do we go about this? Well, we know, and again, this is ASD. We're going to keep this in ASD because we are going to specify a product, a hold down product, whether it be there's a bunch of different manufacturers. Uh, personally, we use Hilti or <laughs> we use Simpson hold downs a lot, and Simpson has a catalog. Uh, I actually mentioned it in my uh, free manuals that you can get a hold of. Uh, throw another thumb tag up there for you or thumbnail up there and check that out later. Um, but all of the capacities for their hold downs are in ASD. They're in allowable capacity. So we want to make sure we continue to design in ASD so we can match our required tensile capacity with their allowable uh, tensile capacity. So, or I should say our required tensile forces against their, or their allowable tensile capacity of their, of their hold down. So uh, keep it in ASD which I said was the worst case uh, load combination is 0.6 dead load um, minus 0.7 EV, which is your vertical component, plus 0.7 EH, which is your horizontal component. So EH is there. Your vertical component is some portion of your... your uh, your weight local to to this shear wall itself. So that would be EV. And then you have your combined dead load uh, DL. And if we go all the way back to the top, I'm going to get a little complex here, but we have a roof dead load of 25 PLF and a wall dead load of 50 PLF. So that's 75 PLF is the total weight of our structure. And obviously that weight is, try is holding down, is counteracting some of that overturning force. Because if you think about it like a, like a pitched tent, which is super, super light in a, in a windstorm, it's just going to pick that tent up and fly away. 
So in this case, but if you if you were to put weight on top of that tent, it's holding that weight down. Um, so the self weight of the building itself is helping to counteract overturning of the building. So dead load is 75 PLF, and that's distribution across. EV, I'm, I'm not going to get into it today again because I don't have the ASCE 716 code in front of me, but if you go to the load combinations, you will see it will take you to chapter 12, which is seismic design, uh, chapter 11, 11 or 12, I can't remember, seismic design criteria, and they have a equation for EV. It's like, oh, you got me. It's like 0 0.3 times SDS times the times the portion of weight at your shear wall. I, eh, I don't want to tell you. I don't want to tell you. I don't, I don't think that's, that's exactly correct. Again, you can't know everything as an engineer, but you need to know where to find it. So chapter 11, chapter 12, it's right in there in the ASC 716. Um, but today we'll just say EV. We'll, we'll scratch that off. We'll assume it's not there. But if you did have something, you know, sorry, let's say, let's say it's EV, but I'm not going to calc out what it is. I'm just going to say, let's say it's 25 PLF. Well, EV is either acting downward or upward. It's kind of like an upward shaking of the structure under seismic uh, event. And that can either help you in the overturning case or hinder you. So in this case, when we're designing our hold downs for tension, it's going to hinder us. So it's going to be in the action of lifting up the building, which means that your dead load, your 0 0.6 dead load, which is 75, minus 0 0.7 EV, which is 25, because you're taking away, you have force acting down, which is your dead load, and then you have some portion of force due to seismic event acting upward. So they counteract each other somewhat. So they, the effects of dead load are reduced slightly. So that's not good, but we have to check. So um, that is going to get us an effective downward dead load of 27.5 PLF. And then obviously EH is 0 0.7 of, what do we say? Four, was it 4.5 kips? Let's see. Uh, 4.5 kips, yeah. So 0 0.7 of 4.5 is 3.15 kips. So 0 0.7 EH equals 3.15 kips. All right, so now we're going to take our moment about, and I'm going to draw it in blue for us, about the point, we're going to call it point A. So you have your overturning moment is going to equal force, which is EH, and which is actually, it's broken down with the factor, with the load factor applied of 3.15 kip, um, times force times perpendicular distance per moment, which is just 10 feet. So overturning moment. 3.15 kip times 10 feet equals 31.5 kip feet for your overturning moment. And then you have a counteracting moment, which is going to be um, mom resist, which is going to equal um, your dead load of 27.5 PLF times the full length of your wall, which is 20 feet. That times 20 feet over two. And then divide it by 1,000 to get it into uh, kip feet. So that's going to get us 5.5 kip feet. So your effective overturning moment, we'll say OTM effective, is going to equal 31.5 minus 5.5 which is going to equal 26 kip feet. Well, we know to resolve, so we always go back to trying to find force couples. So we resolve moment through couples. Our, our couple is through our compression and tension hold downs. Well, both of them are hold downs, but, um, and the couple is the distance between them. So that overturning moment is resolved in a tension compression couple at the ends of our shear wall. And that means in order to get that tensile capacity or that tensile force, we take our overturning moment and we divide it by the length of our shear wall, 20 feet. 
that uh, t required, because we're still in ASD, is going to be 26 divided by 20, is going to be 1.3 kips of upward force. So that's our required tensile force acting on our hold down. So we need to choose a product that has an allowable capacity that is greater than the required force. Um, what I'm going to do is hop onto the internet, we're going to go to the Simpson catalog, and we're going to go choose a product. Here we are, wood construction connectors, Simpson Strong Tie 2019-2020 edition. Let's, uh, let's shoot down to the, the hold down section. So here we are, and we are on the hold down and tension ties section. You can see they, they have a color-coded tab on the, uh, the right-hand side here. And if you had a paper catalog, it's, actually, it's pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. But I can't mark this up because we're online. So um, I'll try to walk us through it with just, just my soothing voice. Um, but we're at hold downs. So that's what we're looking for because we're sizing hold downs. And I like the HDU. Um, hold down, but there's many different types. There's straps, like I said, you're in the section of hold downs and tension straps. Tension straps could be used as hold downs if properly detailed, um, but we're going to specifically choose a hold down product. HDU I like, so I use the HDU2, um, as you can see right here, SDS 2.5, and this gives criteria, and normally we'd call this type of hold down out, and then we'd give a general note that says like, you know, all Simpson products to be installed per um, per manufacturer's uh, specifications and recommendations. So that way, everything that's that's talked about in here, the contractor needs to meet that criteria because we don't want to we don't want to try to say how to install the product. The company who made the product has already done that to a T. So um, HDU two gives you fastener types, gives you wood fasteners, gives you uh, different fastening options. Uh, gives you anchor bolt diameter because in the end of the day, this hold down is going to be fastened to wood studs and then uh, is going to be anchored down into the concrete. So if we look over here, and they also give you what's important, minimum wood member size, so that this is the size of the member that you need to attach your hold down to. So it might not, most often, it's not just a single two by that's in your stud wall. Most of the time you have to either, you have to beef it up with either two or... Um, a wood post or something like that when you get into bigger ones. So you, you have to check that criteria. And actually, like we see here, HDU2, if we come across, they call out a minimum wood member size of a three by three and a half. So that means a two by six wouldn't cut it, but two two by sixes nailed properly together would cut it. So that's how we would probably detail that. Um, and then you see your allowable tensile load. This is DFSP, so that's Doug Fur. Um, Spruce pine, uh, yeah, Doug fir, I know, definitely Doug fir. Doug fir, we're going to say, is what we have been designing with. That's the type of wood that we've been constructing with. So we're in this blue category. And HDU2, we have an allowable tensile load, allowable tensile capacity of 3,075 pounds. And that already has um, factors of safety applied per whatever the manufacturer has decided. Most of the time, it's pretty high factors of safety, two, three, sometimes higher. Um, but we do not need to apply any additional factor of safety to that. So we can go back now that we have our T allowable, which equals basically three kips, which is greater than T required. So we're OK. And that's where we would call out, you know, Simpson HDU2. Uh, I forget, 2.5 SDS or something like that. And you'd say what the anchor type is and the fasteners and the post, the embedment um, of, your, of your anchor. So now you would also need to, so that's the, um, that's the hold down itself, but now you still need to calculate the anchor bolt that it's attaching to. They specify the size of the anchor bolt, but now you need to give embedment, stuff like that, um, and check the capacity of that. And that's where omega, overstrength factor, comes into play again. And that's also where, um, what do I want to get at here? Uh, it's concrete and it's anchor design, so you're going to want to be designing under LRFD criteria. So you would have to go back to when we designed, when we were here and we're using this load case. 
Um, instead of ASD, you would now want to do LRFD, redo this load case, get your forces, get T ultimate, and then design your um, anchor bolt for your hold down for LRFD forces. So it can be a little tedious having to go back and forth with the two different um, uh, load cases and, lo and governing load cases, but it is important. It's very important. So keep that in mind. And again, today, I'm sorry, but it's, it would just take forever and it'd be too long of a video, but I won't be designing the anchorage into the concrete itself. So, but we're at the end. Um, we've done our shear wall um, sheathing design. We've done nailing design. We have done uh, anchor bolt design for our sill plates. And we've done hold down design. And we've gone to, we've specified a manufacturer. We've done many, many things. And we've talked about many things. And um, I hope this has helped everyone. It's been a really hot topic that a lot of you have wanted to see. Uh, so this is, this is wood construction um, you know, this is wood design, so this is something that you'll see it everywhere, commercial and, and, and big wood construction design. This is, this is how it's done. You know, for residential, you might not see hold downs because the, the weight, the, the forces acting on the structure and the, you know, the class of the structure. So when you get into seismic design, you have your site class and you also have your seismic design criteria. Those might be low enough where your forces that you have to design for are small enough that the weight of the structure itself prevents overturning and prevents any tensile capacity in your end studs. So sometimes in residential, you might get away with not having to design any hold downs. But um, once you get into some bigger projects, commercial projects, you're going to see these all the time, especially I've done a couple fire stations now, so those are essential facilities in a seismic event. So you have some very stringent and very high um, seismic demands that you're designing for. So the hold down capacities and the forces acting on the hold downs can get pretty big. But that is, in essence, the beginning of how you design a shear wall. And we've, we have gone through a lot, so don't think that this is just like a total cookie cutter, like very simplistic version and that can't, you can't really apply it to real, real life. This, this could be a real-life shear wall. Um, we've gone through all the steps required. So uh, pat yourself on the back. You know, you know a lot more now. And we've done it. So leave a like. Leave a comment below if you're still hanging about. You know, I hope you, I got that, that one person still here at the end of all these videos. And you're like, I did it. I've designed a shear wall. Great job. Great job to everyone still hanging in there. Um, it's a decently long process, but you can start to automate a few things and you get used to it because this is something that you got to design with every building just about. So you start to get in the groove of it. Like, subscribe if you haven't already. I mean, why haven't you? We're literally the greatest learning channel for structural engineering. At least I hope we get to that point. Uh, if you haven't, tell a friend, tell a family member, tell anybody who's interested in structural engineering or just wanting to learn about the built environment. You know, every person that you tell, uh, if every person on the team told somebody, we double our team size, which would be freaking fantastic. So that's more potential engineers. That's more people maybe becoming engineers, and that would be really fantastic. So until next time, this is Rich with Kesteva, and I will see everyone later. Bye.